thank you for joining us. We're excited to talk about Americana Land, where country and Western meet rock and roll with author John Millward and portrait artist Mar Margie Grieve. If you're watching online and have questions, please post them in the chat. And for those of you in the room, be thinking about what you want to ask, and we'll get to everyone's questions at the end of the program. So I'm going to start with introducing John. He has written about popular music for more than 40 years. He was the chief pop music critic for the Chicago Daily News and US Today, USA Today, and has written for Rolling Stone, The New York Times, The Philadelphia Inquirer, No Depression, and many others. He is also the author of Crossroads, How the Blues Shaped Rock and Roll and Rock Saved the Blues. And Margie's gonna show, join us in just a, a little bit, but uh, she her work has appeared in Rolling Stone and The New Yorker and has been shown in galleries in New York City and the Hudson Valley. So welcome, I'm so glad to have you here. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you to do some reading and then Margie's gonna come talk about her art and I'll come back afterwards and we'll do questions. Thank you everybody for uh, coming out to the reading. Uh, the first thing when you talk about Americana land is to try to define it. <laughs> so Americana is hard to define, but easier to recognize. In the 1990s, bands such as Wilco and the Jayhawks and such singer songwriters as Steve Earle and Lucinda Williams combined elements of rock and country and were said to be playing alt country. That's when a couple of promoters created a chart to monitor airplay for such records. They originally wanted to call it the crucial country chart, but felt it was too big a slight on mainstream country. Then they came up with Americana. That one stuck with me after I thought about what it meant musically, said Rob Bleedstein which was really nothing. So it was our chance to define it as something. The Americana Music Association defines Americana as contemporary music that incorporates elements of various American roots music styles, including country, roots rock, folk, bluegrass, R&B, and blues, resulting in a distinctive roots-oriented sound that lives in a world apart from the pure forms of the genres upon which it may draw. While acoustic instruments are often present and vital, Americana also uses a full electric band. Both broad and vague, the term became a useful handle for roots-oriented musicians. Americana Land focuses on the long history of connections between country and Western, bluegrass, folk, singer-songwriters, and rock and roll. This approach is similar to Miriam Webster's more precise definition of Americana as a genre of American music having roots in early folk and country music. But Americana was happening long before it had a name. Think of string bands, blues singers, folk musicians, and jazz players passing songs and instrumental techniques from one generation to the next. The modern history begins with the 1927 recordings of Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family. Then Hank Williams twisted a yodel into 1949's Lovesick Blues, and Elvis Presley paired an Arthur Crudup blues with a Bill Monroe bluegrass song for his 1954 Sun Records debut. Ten years later, the Beatles cut country songs by Buck Owens and Carl Perkins, and brought those influences into their own tunes. The Birds, inspired by Bob Dylan and the Beatles, pioneered folk rock and, a few years later, country rock. Dylan turned heads when he went to Nashville to record 1966's Blonde on Blonde with the city's best musicians. Willie Nelson left Music City to become a Texas outlaw who appealed to fans of both country and rock. Guy Clark and Towns Van Zant went from Texas to Nashville and nurtured a songwriting circle that included Steve Earle and Rodney Crowell. All this inspired recent generations of musicians to make music at the corner of country and rock. 
that's Americana. I kind of fashioned this a little with Texas in mind, <laughs> you may notice. Willie Nelson personifies a musical mix of Americana. As a Texas teenager, he played music in a combo with his recently passed sister, Bobby, and promoted a Bob Wills concert not far from his childhood home in Abbott. Nelson figures that about 500 people came to the show. The gate receipts barely covered the band's guarantee and left nothing for the young promoter whose group opened the show. He hit the bandstand at eight and didn't leave it for, for hours, said Nelson of Wills. His band watched him all the time and he only had to nod or point the bow of his fiddle to cue band members to play a solo. He was the greatest dance hall band leader ever. Nelson always played music, but early in his career, he made ends meet working as a DJ. In 1960, he finally moved to Nashville from Dallas after a productive week, in which he wrote Nightlife, Funny How Time Slips Away, and Crazy. Nelson moved his family into Dunn's Trailer Court, where, according to former resident Roger Miller's King of the Road, there are trailers for sale or rent, rooms to let 50 cents. Before long, Farron Young took Nelson's four walls to the top of the country charts. Young de declined the songwriter's offer to sell him the tune for $500 and kindly lent him the money. At about that time, Hank Cochran, brother of Eddie Summertime Blues Cochran, helped Nelson sign a writer's contract with Pamper Music, a publishing firm that was half owned by Ray Price, who would make nightlife a hit. Willie liked talking shop at Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, located across the alley from the Grand Old Opry, where he'd drink with such songwriters as Miller and Harlan Howard. One night at Tootsie's, Nelson played his recording of Crazy on the jukebox and piqued the interest of Hank Cochran and Patsy Cline's husband, Charlie Dick. Though the hour was late, they decided to wake up Patsy. A nervous Nelson stayed in the car and left the pitch to Cochran. Patsy went out there and drug his ass in the house and had him sing it to her, said Cochran. But Klein thought that Crazy was too much of a pop song and producer Owen Bradley had to twist her arm to give it a shot. But first she had to ignore Nelson's version. No one should try to follow my phrasing, said Nelson. I'll lay back on the beat or jump ahead. When it comes to singing a song, I've got all the time in the world. Klein had a similar distinctive approach and crazy, one of the best-selling country songs of all time made her a legend. Klein transcends genres and generations with a catalog of songs still cherished by Americana artists. Even though her style is considered country, said Lucinda Williams, her delivery is more like a classic pop singer. Musicians quickly learn that the real money in the music business is in songwriting. And Willie bought a family compound outside Nashville with the earnings from having his tunes recorded by others. But Willie's own recordings produced in a mainstream manner by guitarist Chet Atkins went nowhere. Then in 1972, he met Jerry Wexler of Atlantic Records at a party at the Nashville home of Harlan Howard. Willie got on the stool late at night when the party had thinned out, said Howard, and he sang like a total album with a gut string and a stool. He just went from one song to the other and Wexler flipped out. Wexler was looking for new turf and had recently signed such pre-Americana acts as John Prine, Doug Somm, and now Willie Nelson, who for the first time brought his own musicians into the recording studio. Wexler heard something in Nelson that Nashville had missed. Your phrasing reminds me of Ray Charles and Sinatra, Wexler told Nelson. Like you, they're great proponents of rubato, elongating one note, cutting off another, swinging with an elastic sense of time only the jazz artists understand. Wexler produced Nelson's two albums for Atlantic, 
Phases and Stages, and Shotgun Willie. But Nelson really ran the show and was finding his way towards a sound that was all his own. Pardon me while I sip some coffee, iced coffee. There are two characters who run through this book, Bob Dylan and Willie Nelson. So here's a bit about Bob. Bob Dylan arrived in New York City in January of 1961. He visited Woody Guthrie, was signed to Columbia Records within a year, and was quickly seen as the face of folk music. One afternoon, Dylan stopped in an empty Greenwich Village club to watch a jazz pianist Thelonious Monk playing stuff that sounded like Ivory Joe Hunter. Dylan told the pianist, I play folk music up the street. We all play folk music, said Monk, but a change was gonna come. Dylan took a road trip across the country as songs by the Beatles dominated the radio hit parade. They were doing things nobody was doing, said Dylan. Their chords were outrageous, just outrageous, and their harmonies made it all valid. I knew they were pointing to the direction where music had to go. Dylan didn't want to be in a band, but he did want to rock. I played all the folk songs with a rock and roll attitude, he said. Musician Peter Stamphill recalls hearing Dylan sing the folk standard Sally Gal at Gertie's Folk City. His singing style and phrasing were stone rhythm and blues. He fitted the two styles together perfectly, clear as a bell. And I realized for the first time that my two true loves, traditional music and rock music, were in fact one. Dylan's Bringing It All Back Home featured his first performances with a full band, and subterranean homesick blues stood out because it wasn't modeled after something by Woody Guthrie or the Carter family. It's from Woody, it's from Chuck Berry, a bit of too much monkey business, said Dylan, and some of the scat songs of the 40s. Dylan got guitarist Mike Bloomfield of the Butterfield Blues Band to help him on his next studio session. The first thing I heard was like a rolling stone, said Bloomfield. He said, hey man, I don't want any of that B.B. King stuff. He had heard records by the birds that knocked him out. He wanted me to play like McGuinn. As the tape rolled in 1965, the birds version of Mr. Tambourine Man was at the top of the charts. In July, a week before Dylan famously went electric at the Newport Folk Festival, he released the songs that Rolling Stone would later call Rock's Greatest Single. For his first road band, Dylan recruited The Hawks, a rhythm and blues quintet that had spent years backing rockabilly singer Ronnie Hawkins. During a long, riotous concert tour, Dylan and his protégés developed a fierce new sound. By the time we did Australia and Europe, said guitarist Robbie Robertson, we had discovered whatever this thing was. It was not light, it was not folky. It was very dynamic, very explosive, and very violent. Mm. This was not the ramshackle sound of Dylan's controversial Newport performance, and not at all like the folk rock of the birds. Instead, this was a rough blueprint for the kind of singer-songwriter rock produced by artists from Bruce Springsteen and John Mellencamp to Steve Earle and Lucinda Williams. After a tumultuous world tour and Dylan's tumble over the handlebars of his Triumph motorcycle, he and his musicians retreated to Woodstock, New York and held informal music sessions in the basement of the house that came to be called Big Pink. Dylan began by surveying his past via a wide variety of folk, country and blues songs. With the covers, Bob was educating us a little, said guitarist Robbie Robertson. The whole folky thing was still very questionable to us. It wasn't the train we came in on. After a world tour that was a high decibel firestorm, performing this music was a far more intimate experience. We played in a circle, said Robertson, like mountain musicians sitting where they can hear each other, someone singing lead and someone singing a harmony, 
and you would just play at that volume. It was in this atmosphere that the Hawks became the band. The songs Dylan played in the basement suggested a latter day version of Harry Smith's anthology of American folk music. They included old blues and songs by Hank Williams, Johnny Cash, the Carter family, Ian Tyson, Eric Von Schmidt, Eric Elvis Presley, and Bobby Charles, recasting his See You Later Alligator as See You Later Allen Ginsberg. Some of the takes were rickety, others spot on. All were imbued with wit and a sense of fun. New songs began to tumble out of Dylan's typewriter. He gave some lyrics to Richard Manuel, who put music to Tears of Rage, and to Rick Danko, who co-wrote This Wheels on Fire. Dylan wrote I Shall Be Released, and all three of these songs would be on the band's music from Big Pink. Joe Boyd, who'd worked behind the scenes at Newport the night Dylan went electric, was now living in London and producing the folk rock band Fairport Convention. There was something fascinating and intimidating about the relentless confidence of Dylan at that time, said Boyd. Those guys sat up there in Woodstock and they felt no necessity to broadcast it. There was a feeling that you could be as cool as you want at the Scotch of St. James or in Laurel Canyon or Greenwich Village, but up here in Woodstock, in this basement room, we're doing shit we know is the best. Willie Nelson might be the most famous Americana star of Texas, but the Lone Star was always thick with songwriters. Mickey Newberry was one of the most successful. And besides writing hits for everybody from Kenny Rogers to Eddie Arnold, he also discovered Towns Van Zandt. In 1968, he brought him to Nashville to meet the man who would produce his first record, Cowboy Jack Clement. A decade earlier, Clement had helped Johnny Cash shape his signature sound at Sun Records. I also took Guy Clark to Nashville, said Newberry, on the strength of a song called Step Inside This House. If I hadn't taken Towns to Nashville, then there wouldn't have been no Guy Clark. Then you think about all the people that said there were major influences were Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt. Now you're talking about Steve Earle, Lyle Lovett, Nancy Griffith, Joe Ely, all of these people. Guy and Susanna Clark were married in 1972. Van Zandt served as best man and for a time lived in the couple's East Nashville home. In the early years, we were always together, said Clark. She and Towns were best friends, and Towns and I were best friends. And he was always in love with my wife. It was Nashville, Tennessee, home of Johnny Cash, and you're a songwriter from Texas. It was top of the world, like Paris in the 20s. Rodney Crowell arrived in Nashville in 1972 and hung out at a popular folk club Bishop's Pub. That's where Crowell first met Steve Earle. Skinny kid with a big black cowboy hat, said Crowell. It was like he stepped right out of a Cormac McCarthy novel. Crowell focused on writing songs worthy of being played at a song circle at Guy and Susanna Clark's house. Towns Van Zandt was pretty much the alpha male, said Crowell. He was smart. He was strung out. He'd come into town and be upstairs kicking heroin. Clark was a more stable role model. His 1975 debut, Old Number One, included Desperados Waiting for a Train, an enduring classic that had background vocals by Earl Crowell and Emmy Lou Harris. It all revived, revolved around Guy, said Crowell, because Guy was the curator of all the wild spirits who were really just a group of songwriters trying to figure out how to do it. Crowell and Earl were among the lucky few who honed their craft under Clark's benign tutelage and who got to carve their initials into his wooden dining table. Fast forward a few years. Emmylou Harris's tour bus pulled into a truck stop near Oklahoma City. Hey, said Harris to Tony Brown, her keyboard player, 
Go to the jukebox and play George Jones's He Stopped Loving Her Today. It's going to kill you. Touring with the Hot Band was a musical education for Brown, who had never listened to popular music as a kid in North Carolina because he played in his preacher father's family gospel group. Gospel music won Brown an audience with Elvis Presley, and the Lord blessed him with a job playing keyboards in the King's band. But by the mid-1980s, Brown was an executive at MCA Records in Nashville, where he signed artists whom he might have met backstage at an Emmy Lou show, including a trio of singer-songwriters from Texas, Nancy Griffith, Lyle Lovett, and the wild card of the bunch, Steve Earle. Initially, both Earl and Levitt gained traction on the country charts, but before long, all three were embraced by listeners who would make them stars of Americana. Brown, who found big time country success producing Vince Gill, Patti Loveless, and Winona Judd, came to recognize that Griffith, Earl, and Lovett fundamentally appealed to a different audience. Artists who are singer songwriters, said Brown, if they can have commercial success on their terms, when the commercial success is over, they can still succeed on their terms. To this day, Guy Clark and Lyle Lovett can play all kinds of places and make good money performing their music to an audience that really appreciates their work, as opposed to playing empty houses to fans who have moved on to the latest artist du jour. Now, speaking of admiring one's work. I admire the artwork of uh, Margie Grieve and we're married. We're married. <laughs> so it's, I bet. Yeah. So I'd like to introduce Margie who's going to give you a little show and tell about her, the artwork she created for Americana Land. So when I started doing the drawings, um, I was working in a computer making the drawings like I had for the last book. And I thought, okay, the drawings are good, but they're kind of blah. They don't really reflect the feeling of Americana. So I said, okay, that's one of them. It's just kind of blah. So I said, well, so what does Americana look like? And then I was thinking, okay, red, white, and blue, blue, blue denim. So my mother collected lots of pieces of um, leftover cutoffs from the blue jeans and she had them since like the seventies. So I had all this stuff to work with. And then I said, okay, the red would be like red bandanas. So I started a collection of red bandanas. And then I said, well, the white would be the muslin and that could be used for the actual bodies of the people and faces. And then I had um, this black felt that's adhesive backed. And um, here's actually somebody's hair that I did not use. Um, that's what I used for some of the hair. And here is my little travel pack of floss. And these are my needles, you can see them. And my little tiny scissors. And that's what I carried around with me and did this in a lot of different places. So, um, so um, while I was doing this, I was thinking I want it to be kind of like a flag or a quilt or something. And I like the idea of a quilt because John is taking all these different stories of all these people and putting them all together like one big quilt. And I thought, well, this, you know, stitching this is kind of like that. So I did that. And then I said, um, okay, I'm going to start with the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers. So this is the Carter family. And it was a good place to start for me because that's where the music started. So I can take it from here and sort of develop the style because I never embroidered portraits before. So, um, so I worked on that. And while I was doing it, I was listening to the music of the artists so I could really get a feel for what they were like. And um, I kind of wanted to have something like this in the background that kind of suggested who they might be. This has little flowers in the background. Um, and then, so I had, um, this is my Elvis and he's the only one who gets a red felt cause he's very special. And I took the pieces from the bandana. This is what I did when I used the bandana, cut little bits of it. So you might even not know it's from a bandana but this one, it's like teardrops and broken hearts. If you take these little paisleys, they look like teardrops. And if you put two together it looks like a little heart. So that was kind of 
an Elvis theme. <laughs> um, and this is Willie, who I, I was actually spending a lot of try time trying to figure out his braids, how to stitch them. And I worked that out and I used the bandana for his actual bandana. And what I liked about this was I have a connection. I don't know if you can see Patsy Cline on the wall behind me, but since Willie wrote crazy from his head to her voice, I have a neckerchief around her. And so I have this connection between Willie and Patsy, which I, I like. Um, then when I went to the library in Woodstock, I found one day this bandana, part of a bandana in a mud puddle. And I said, wow, that's a really cool bandana. I could use that. And so I washed it a couple times and I used it for the background of Dylan. And I think that's nice because he was in Woodstock and it has this almost like an Eastern feel. I don't know, I, I like it, I really liked it. And then I had enough left over, even though it was just half a bandana, I said, oh, I can use that for the band. So that's their connection. Um, and then I did for Joni Mitchell, um, her first album has these beautiful drawings that she did, these line drawings of flowers, and it's all kind of swirling. And I wanted to have that for her, just for that feeling of the, like a kind of free flowers. So I did that. And then for Dolly, instead of that blah drawing in the computer, um, I have this with the little wildflowers in the background, which I, one of my favorite songs from Trio, Wildflowers. And this, I wanted to make her hair full and her whole figure full and then taper at the bottom so you really get that full dolly feel. And then like for Johnny Cash, I said, okay, I'm gonna put these, these lines in the background that sort of suggest prison. And you know, he was in prison, sang in the prison and it just, it just has a kind of subtle background that feels like that. And then similar for Merle Haggard, I did this white lines and it was so cool because I was doing this and then John said, I'm gonna name that chapter white line fever. And I was like, oh, that's exactly what I did. So we were kind of in sync there. Um, and then for Towns Van Zandt, I was listening to a lot of his music and it was pretty sad. And this is kind of wings. Um, in the song Flying Shoes, it's about kind of leaving this world and going on to the next and just, you know, flying off. And so I kind of gave him these wings to fly away. Um, and Chef Berry, I made these wheels that look like records and he's, you know, going in his automobile. So, you know, that kind of has that movement for Chuck. I like that. And then for my, for my last one, I did this Jerry Lee Lewis before COVID and I took these little pieces of the bandana and I thought I'll make these great balls of fire. And now when I look at it, it looks like COVID. <laughs> but, um, but I think it's really good for Jerry. So, um, so that's kind of my process and, and how I worked it. I didn't use the bandana on all the pieces. I felt like some, it worked better for them and some I just used the embroidery. So, and I kept it very minimal color, really kind of red, white, and blue with some black. So that's my process. <laughs> Thank you, Margie, she'll be back. <laughs> she'll be back. In the early 1980s, famous figures of Americana were gigging in, of all places, New York City. The Buddy Miller Band played, a, played regularly at the Lone Star Cafe, the Fifth Avenue Club with a giant iguana on its roof. Miller, who'd grown up in New Jersey, was a soulful singer and guitarist who came to the city from Austin, Texas, where he'd fallen in love with Julie Griffin, the singer in a band for which he played guitar. Buddy and Julie soon met Larry Campbell, who joined the band to play fiddle and guitar. Campbell had grown up in the city and gigged around the country before playing with John Harold and working recording sessions in Manhattan. Working musicians are happy and economically obliged to play with a lot of people. At the time, said Campbell, I was also working with Susie Terrell and Patty Skialfa from way before Patty got together with Bruce Springsteen. The Buddy Miller Band played country gigs at city limits and other clubs while backing headliners at the Lone Star. Since we love that music so much, said John Leventhal, another musician on the scene, we would really listen to the great country records and analyze them, 
Ray Price records of the 50s, Merle and Buck records of the 60s, or George Jones records from any period to really understand not only the songwriting, but what the musicians played and how it was all put together. Jim Lauderdale came to New York to play the clubs and write songs after attending college in North Carolina and bonded with the other urbane cowboys. Lauderdale bonded with, in the same way that British kids listened to blues records or rock and roll in the late 50s, he said. For this group, there was something about country that affected us all deeply, made us pour over those records and share a real passion for it. The Buddy Miller Band attracted the interest of record labels, but Julie, who'd grown up with an abusive father, was hesitant. Like many people, I had a lot of unresolved, crippled parts of myself, said Julie, but I wasn't one of those people who were good at denial. I lived it out every gig, have a few drinks, a few drugs, and go a little crazy. On stage, Julie was an open book. Her heart was right on her sleeve, said Campbell, this primal emotional thing that would come out of her sounding exactly like you would hear her today, totally unfiltered. But soon Julie found her muse. Yeah, said Julie. You might say that Buddy being Jewish and all was quite surprised. He and the band were at this bar that we were playing and they were wondering where I'd gone. And I called them at the bar and said, Buddy, you're not gonna believe this but I've just met some Christians and I've given my life to Jesus and I can't come back. Miller, with a calendar full of upcoming gigs, called a singer who'd impressed him in Austin, Sean Colvin. She'd played in a country swing band and performed as a solo folk singer and was more than happy to come to New York in December, 1980 to join a working band. But Buddy had a broken heart. And he soon left New York, as did Campbell, who went on the road with Doug Somm. It was now the Sean Colvin band. And in need of a lead guitarist, she reached out to John Leventhal, who'd seen her play with Buddy. Colvin and Leventhal collaborated on songs and a romance. Buddy joined Julie in Texas. It was weird enough for me, said Julie. But then six months later, Buddy became a Christian too. I'll never get over it. He read that Bible that I left that was under the sofa. It was like God said, okay, buddy, time to meet me. God, as is said, works in mysterious ways. Fast forward to the early 1990s, when Colvin was part of the New York fast folk scene that launched Suzanne Vega. Colvin sang on Vega's hit song, Luca, and toured Europe in her band. She then got a deal with Columbia Records, Leventhal produced Colvin steady on, and though the couple's romance didn't last, their record won the contemporary folk Grammy. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, Rodney Crowell and John Leventhal co-produced an album in the early 1990s by Jim Lauderdale, who'd moved from New York to Los Angeles and reconnected with Buddy Miller, who played lead guitar in his band while helping his wife, Julie, record albums for the Christian market. Colvin sang back up on that album as well as those by Julie Miller. But for King of Broken Hearts, a song written about Graham Parsons, Crowell called his old boss. Emmy Lou Harris was like the queen, said Julie. Nobody could imagine actually knowing her personally. Few people heard Planet of Love, but those who did mattered. Country star George Strait, for one, heard and cut both King of Broken Hearts and Where the Sidewalk Ends on the same day. Lauderdale has enjoyed a long career as a recording artist, but it's songwriting royalties that have, has kept him comfortably solvent. In the late 1980s, Rodney Crowell and his wife, Roseanne Cash, had the biggest albums of their careers, Crowell's Diamonds and Dust and Cash's King's Record Shop. But when subsequent projects floundered on the charts, they both turned to creating more personal recordings. The couple also divorced, with Roseanne re relocating to New York City, where she reinvented herself as the bohemian daughter of a country legend who wrote prose as well as songs. 
When it came time to write and produce her next album, she turned to John Leventhal, a Manhattan neighbor whom she'd met through Crowell. Sean Colvin recorded her second album with bassist Larry Klein, who was married to Joni Mitchell. There was this whole incestuous mini drama going on where Roseanne was now dating and working with John Leventhal, who just finished producing an album for Rodney Crowell, Roseanne's ex-husband. By the time Colvin collaborated with Leventhal on a few small repairs, he would be married to Roseanne. Col Colvin's Sonny Came Home won the 1998 Grammy Awards for both Song and Record of the Year. During the broadcast, Old Dirty Bastard of the Wu-Tang Clan interrupted her acceptance speech to declare, Wu-Tang is for the children. But that wasn't the weirdest thing that happened. When Bob Dylan, who won Album of the Year for Time Out of Mind, was performing Love Sick, a bare-chested man with soy bomb written on his chest bounded onto the stage to do a spastic dance alongside Dylan, who played a guitar solo as the trespasser was hustled off the stage. Looking on with bemused concern was a new member of Dylan's group, Larry Campbell, who'd once played with Colvin in the Buddy Miller Band. And finally, we return to Willie. Willie Nelson paid a 1972 visit to Chris Christofferson in Durango, Mexico, where he was acting in director Sam Peckinpah's Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Christofferson had urged Bob Dylan to write a song for the film. He came up with Knocking on Heaven's Door and also made his dramatic debut playing a cowboy called Anonymous. He was a little shy, scared to death, said Nelson, they had him jumping and running on them horses, and he ain't no cowboy. Dylan was more comfortable with six strings than six guns. Willie ended up serenading the cast and crew all day long at Peckinpah's house, said Christofferson, gladly accommodating Dylan's request to hear more and more. Nelson, who is now settled outside Austin, Texas, imagined a record that was equally unadorned and got his chance when he signed a new contract with Columbia Records that gave him creative control. The inspiration for Nelson's career reinvention came from a song he'd sung as a Fort Worth DJ in the 1950s and to his kids at bedtime, Tales of the Red-Headed Stranger. Nelson fleshed out the story of the enigmatic cowboy and his black steed with original songs and covers of Eddie Arnold's I Couldn't Believe It Was True and Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain, a song written by the man who discovered Hank Williams, Fred Rose. But the true revelation of Redheaded Stranger was a stripped down sound built on Nelson's acoustic guitar, a low key, often absent rhythm section and instrumental flourishes by Mickey Raphael on harmonica and Willie's sister, Bobby on piano cut and mixed in five days for $4,000 at a studio in Garland, Texas. Nelson used the rest of his $60,000 recording budget for living expenses and to upgrade the band's equipment and tour bus. Columbia executives were more than skeptical about a submission that sounded like a demo recording in need of a Nashville polish, but Nelson held fast and Redheaded Stranger became both a cultural signifier and a commercial smash, with Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain, Nelson's first number one country hit. The country music maverick had hit the big time with an Americana concept album that felt familiar to anyone who'd grown up watching cowboys at the movies and on television. It would be another five years before Nelson came up with a song that would define his career on the road again. He wrote it for the film Honeysuckle Rose in which Nelson played, well, Willie. But it was the mainstream success of Redheaded Stranger that ensured a long and profitable run on the concert circuit. Along the way, Nelson would release a steady stream of albums that ranged from the artistically inspired 
to the amiably workmanlike. Walking the beach in Malibu in 1977, Willie met Booker T. Jones, the keyboardist of Booker T. and the MGs, a band best known for its instrumental hit, Green Onions. They became fast friends, and Nelson asked Jones to write him an arrangement of a pop song from the 1940s, Moonlight in Vermont. Nelson was now very comfortable in his musical skin and had a notion to do an album drawn from the great American songbook. I remember the first night I sang Hoagie Carmichael Stardust with my band at the Austin Opera House, said Nelson. There was a kind of stunned silence in the crowd for a moment, and then they exploded with cheering and whistling and applauding. The kids in the crowd thought Stardust was a new song that I had written. The older folks remembered the song well and loved it as much as I did. We had a lot of common influences, said Jones, who ended up producing and arranging an album that came to be called Stardust. Ray Charles was a big influence of mine, and he was a big influence on Willie. I had heard Bob Wills in his Texas country jazz. Willie just loved jazz. Nelson also appreciated great songs. Besides the title tune, the album included Duke Ellington's Don't Get Around Much Anymore, George and Ira Gershwin's Someone to Watch Over Me, and Kurt Vile's September songs. Columbia Records predictably blocked at the prospect of selling an album of standards by a singer they promoted as an outlaw. Then Stardust became a multi-platinum number one country album with two chart topping singles, Hoagie Carmichael's Georgia On My Mind and Irving Berlin's Blue Skies. Both Willie Nelson and Bob Dylan have re recently made albums of songs associated with Frank Sinatra. I learned a lot about phrasing listening to Frank, said Nelson. He didn't worry about behind the beat or in front of the beat or whatever. He could sing it either way. And that's the feel you have to have. Bob and Willie have a lot more than Frank in common. Both are entrepreneurs. Dylan shocked many in 2020 when he sold the publishing rights to his catalog of more than 600 songs to Universal Music Publishing Group for a price said to be more than $300 million. Dylan also sells original paintings and ironworks in art galleries and markets a line of premium whiskey under the name Heaven's Door. Nelson sells Willie's Reserve marijuana products and makes a political point of operating his Honeysuckle Rose tour bus on biodiesel diesel fuel, but the bus really runs on music. Imagine Willie and Bob boarding the Honeysuckle Rose with a couple of acoustic guitars. It's the traveling Willie Berries on the road again and singing the songs of America in the long dark winter of the 2020 pandemic. They roll through Alabama playing Hank's Howlin' at the Moon and trade blue yodels as they approach Meridian, Mississippi. Thinking of Memphis to the north, they toast Cash with Big River and Elvis with Mystery Train and pay tribute to the Black Lives Matter demonstrators, not with Woody's This Land is Your Land, but the Carter family song that gave him the melody, When the World's on Fire. They're two old men, wise to the ways of a wicked world, and grateful to share the songs of a century. They roll past road houses that will once again be filled with fiddles and telecasters and quiet cafes where songwriters will debut new songs at open mics. They reach Texas and like a couple of kids break into Buddy Holly's Not Fade Away. Bob and Willie trading tunes and living in the heart of Americana land. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. So, so much about that. So interesting. So I think the first thing I think is really interesting about Americana as a genre is that it, it's not really a single genre, right? Like it's so many different trade, you know, branches coming into a, a, a trunk. And do, do you think that they decided they needed to come up with a new name because there was just so much stuff that was 
similar, but not exactly similar? Or was it more about just figuring out a way to market kind of that all together to a different kind of group of people? Right. I, I look at it as partly we look at it all things through ourselves. <laughs> but as I was getting older, I noticed acts that I liked weren't hitting high in the pop charts. And rock and roll was becoming a, a, a minor genre <laughs> alongside dance music and hip hop and rap. So I kind of look at Americana as um, rock and roll for grownups, which has singer songwriters, kind of the more thoughtful and rowdy music too, because the music audience has gotten so spread out among a wealth of genres and everything that it kind of became a central calling card. But it's kind of funny because an act like Chris Stapleton is Americana, but he's, he blew up. He's big. He's a country star. So there's a, this funny line when, are you Americana? Are you country? Are you rock? But there's a certain soul and sensibility in Americana. It's got, it's got trumped up. It's like world music. What yeah. is world music? <laughs> I love that. Um, so one of the things I thought was very interesting that you mentioned as you were talking about things was that Patsy Cline's management thought crazy was too much of a pop song. No, he did. Oh, okay. Owen Bradley produced Patsy in the mid fifties for a minute. And they did Walking After Midnight, which was a big hit. Mm -hmm. She kind of disappeared until she signed with MCA and Owen Bradley could m shape the kind of material she was doing. And she was, actually, when she did Walking After Midnight, I think she was on, I'm forgetting now, some talent show in New York. It was a big deal. And she wanted to wear her cowgirl outfit. And they said, no, 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 no we're going to put you in an evening gown and kind of put over that's, you know, her resistance to the counter is the same thing about it's too pop. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, cause for me, that's just, and I will admit I've never heard Willie's original version, but to me, that is such a quintessential country song, right? Okay. It's just hilarious to me that they were, she originally thought it was too pop. Um, so Margie, I want to talk a little bit about your art. So first of all, the art is so amazing. Um, and I know you kind of talked about kind of how the, the lines go through that. So, you know, you use some of some imagery that harkened back to some album covers and some other things. So how did you kind of do your research in figuring out what kind of elements you were going to add to those things? much of it I had such a feeling already because I've been listening to this music for so long and then if I didn't have a strong feeling I, like Jimmy Rogers I said well what I don't know you know what does he look like where is he coming from and so I looked at videos I found videos on YouTube of him you know singing at the station and I was thinking of the smoke coming from the train and he was coughing because he had tuberculosis and like <laughs> how do you put that into a picture well I just had these like smoky circles and but it's like trying to somehow visualize what they're singing about or who they are. And so I, I, some things I had a strong idea about before just from listening to it, but some things I really did research like the videos, there's so much, you can find so much stuff online. I mean, you know, and sometimes you just hear something and it just gives you a feeling that, that you can, you know, that like Elvis, that like teardrops and broken hearts. That's how I feel about him for his life and for the way he made people feel. And just, you know, it just seemed like a good thing for him. <laughs> So. And do you start, so I know you originally said you started originally drawing them on the computer and then said, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. Do you start with a pattern or do you just freeform kind of embroider that? No, I started with a sketch and then I scanned it into the computer and I started doing drawings because la the last book was perfect for the computer because it was Crossroads where it was country blues from American South and the British guys coming together. So doing it in a computer, it was like, let's electrify that, you know, 
country sound. So I was electrifying the drawings, but it just didn't work for this because this is so handy. This is like you sit on the porch, the front porch, and you're picking and singing. And so I was actually sitting on the front porch and stitching. So it's a set, like you can just hold it in your hand and make it at home. And so it had to have that feeling. And it just took me a while to figure that out, like how to do that, you know? And then as I started doing it, it's like, okay, this is, this is working. This is how I do it, you know? But it was like a process, like the music develops, you know? And then you kind of get a rhythm. Yeah. So one of the things I think is really interesting about Americana too, is that it's a lot of singer songwriters. Like I feel like of many of the, the genres that we have out there, this one is really, really heavy that way where they might have a couple of hits, but they really make their money from writing and selling those songs for other people, maybe within their own kind of circle of, of friends. I mean, like the number of things that, that Jackson Brown has written for so many other people is, is so crazy, right? Even Dolly as a writer, I mean, she yes. has stuff that she sings, but I Will Always Love You, boy, did she make a lot of money on that? And she very I mean, shrewdly didn't. Elvis, Elvis, speaking of Elvis, right. wanted to record that song in the uh, early 70s when it came out. And she said, I'd be honored. But then she learned that Colonel Parker would want to have the publishing for that song mm -mm. if Elvis were to record it. And Dolly said, I just can't do that. She's smart. So <laughs> she was very smart. Her yeah. payday came about 15 years later when yeah. it was a lot of time. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I recently saw a uh, an interview that she did with, I'm not going to remember what his last name is, but I know his first name is Graham and he, he's a British, it's a, it's a British TV, a British interview show. I can't think of what, what it's called, but that she talked about the first time she heard Whitney Houston's version where, uh, you know, he, he was like, you know, were you part of the recording process? And she was like, no, you know, they, they came and said they wanted to use that, that song for her movie, The Bodyguard. And I was like, yeah, okay, you know, here's what it's going to cost you. And then like, I totally forgot that they were going to use that song. She's like, I'm driving home one day and it starts. And I'm like, what is this? this is my song. And that she had to like pull over on the side of the road and just sit there and, and listen to the song, which I, I just love her, but I think that's just such a quintessential Dolly Parton story. Yeah. Right. Especially when you think of where it came from, she said she was with Porter Wagner. She just wanted to write down how she felt about how she had to leave. And so she just wrote down how she felt and it was so personal, but it became so universal. And to finish that story, Porter Wagner then sued her. <laughs> 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 later, yeah, yeah, yeah. she got out of that. <laughs> Yes. So, John, talk a little bit about your research process for the book and then how you take that research and turn it into words on the page. I'm happy to be talking to a librarian because the Woodstock <laughs> Library, which is connected to all the upstate libraries, was a constant font of mm -hmm. books. So for a year or two, I was reading everything I could find on the subject and taking notes. And I have 40 years of interviews that I've done with a, a number of these people anyway, so I could add my original reporting. And then it's a matter of finding a through line. I pretty like Crossroads, chronologically, chronological order is usually the most logical. And chapters cross over here and there. But, you know, that, that became... Um, the thread of it and then but you know after chapter one i had to give a whole chapter to hank williams because he's so huge and after that nobody got a full chapter hank is the <laughs> only one who did <laughs> so uh when we we first got on writing and then it's writing rewriting i also am a member of a writer's group so they would read chapters as i worked on it so so when we first kind of got on Zoom uh, before we went live, you and I were talking about Spotify. So talk, oh, talk yeah. to the audience about Spotify and this book. Well, it's just in, in case people are interested, you could look up in Spotify, search out my name, and you can find playlists for each of the individual chapters. And there are like you know, 
90 minutes or two hours each some. And then I uh, decided, well, I'll try to be a promoter here and I'll do little podcasts, which is kind of a misnomer because it's really me just reading excerpts of chapter one or what, whichever chapter and adding the music, which if you, if you are a, a subscriber to Spotify, you can hear all of the music, not just 30 second things. So that you can find that under Americana land or my, my name as well. All right, so we have time for, if anybody in the audience has questions, we have about three more minutes. So make sure you post your questions in the chat. Um, I have time for one more while we're waiting for that. So can you talk about any upcoming artists that you think we should check out? Well, <laughs> that's Brandy always true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's upcoming. She's arrived. She's, I know. <laughs> um, but it's funny. I recently turned 70. It's kind of sobering. And you go, well, I'm interested. I'm always looking for new music. But I also recognize time is limited. <laughs> so I find myself going back to older music as well. It's all one big menu for me. But a few, few names to mention. This woman, Allison Russell, has gotten a lot of uh, attention for Outside Child, which was re nominated for a Grammy. And she's one of the, a number of black performers who are found, finding a niche in Americana. Charlie Crockett from Texas, who's kind of a, kind of a latter day honky tonk kind of guy. And I, I'm infatuated with this group, I'm With Her, which uh, <laughs> includes three very talented women, Sarah Watkins, Aoife O'Donovan and Sarah Jeruse. Both Aoife and Sarah have made records in the last couple of years that are great. Yeah. World on the Ground is um, is uh, Sarah's record that won the uh, Grammy for Best Americana album last year. And it, as Margie said, you got to give a shout out to Brandi um, Carlisle, especially after she did that lovely Newport thing with Joni Mitchell and just, yeah. you know. You I cried. <laughs> 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 yeah i cried i i i re i watched that just this week and i do have to say winona was sitting behind joni and was bawling the whole time and i was like man stop putting her on the screen because i can't stop crying <laughs> it was great well I think we're gonna leave it here. So I want to thank both of you guys for joining us today. Um, it's been really great. Um, and for those of you in the audience, if you'd like to purchase the book, uh, you can get copies from our local independent bookstore here in Fort Worth, The Dock. Um, and we do have a lot of great author visits coming up in the next few months. So uh, check out fortworthlibrary.org and see what we've got coming up. So thanks, John and, and Margie, so much. Important local pleasure. bookstore and library, really important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.